Good morning once again, Calvary family. Brother Fred Carlson, it's good to have you with us this morning. We continue to be in prayer for you and your family. These lovely flowers up front are in memoriam to our dear sister Maxine Carlson, who once again this Sunday worships in the very presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. There are some things I think that we make too complicated. Now, granted, there are some things that I don't think we are honest about the level of complication or complexity or nuance, etc., etc. But there are some things in the Christian life that are just flat out straightforward. We don't have to, we don't have to argue things into the ground. It's pretty clear what we're supposed to do, what we're not supposed to do, who we've been made to be and who we've not been made to be. Now, we like to nuance it. We like to make exceptions. We like to argue some things away. But today, this is going to be one of those days where things are clear enough that we're not going to be able to argue away what is being communicated to us by the Spirit of Christ through the Word of Christ, to the body of Christ. So turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2 as we continue in our study of this beautiful letter. We will again just look at two verses. We are in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Pause. Are we, are we with each other? Did we hear it? I'm going to read it one more time. Brothers and sisters whom I love so dearly, I urge you, I beg you, I plead with you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. These wrongly directed passions that do war against your very soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles, keep it honorable, so that when they speak against you, as though you are evildoers, they may, through your continued faithfulness, that they would see your good deeds and they would glorify God on the day of visitation. Verse 11, abstain. Verse 12, engage. That's the Christian life in a nutshell. The fact of the matter is, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 serve as a bridge here in this letter. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12 serve as the summary of everything that follows. See, up to this point, we have received some rich, beautiful, fundamental theology. Theology that grounds us, reminds us of who God is, reminds us of our sin, reminds us of salvation in Jesus Christ through His shed blood. It reminds us of our new identity in Christ. Sprinkled in that good theology has been just touches toward practice, the call to holiness, 
the call to love, the call to walk with God and to trust Him in difficult times. The rest of 1 Peter is going to now unpack those themes and it's going to build upon the theology that we have been given up to this point to give us very practical insight as to how we are to do this very thing. What does it look like for us to be holy people? How do we enact that? How do we trust God in difficult times? Where are our affections directed? Where do they come from? To whom are they directed back toward? What hope do we have? How are we to love? Believers? And how are we to to love unbelievers? Verses 11 and 12 give us in basic form, you need to abstain from everything that does not reflect the character of Christ and does not draw your attention to Christ. In verse 12, you need to live holy lives before everybody with the hope that your life of fidelity, your life of faithfulness to God in holiness would cause even those people who speak evil against you it would cause them to come to know Christ and glorify God when He chooses to visit them. I, along with Peter, look at a people that I love so deeply care about so intensely, pray for continually, spend my life with regularly. Pleading for the honor and the glory of the name of the one true living triune creator, redeemer God to be promoted and protected And for your flourishing, your well-being, our well-being as a church, your well-being individually, your well-being as families, your well-being as extended families, your well-being in your neighborhoods, your well-being in your workplace, your well-being in your own skin. Please, recognize that we are sojourners. Recognize that we are pilgrims. That doesn't mean that this world doesn't matter. In fact, it means quite the opposite. God created this world and all that is in it. He created it for good. We are sojourners in a world that is so affected by sin, it's hard to even recognize what the goodness could possibly be anymore. We live in a world that is governed by philosophical systems that are so contrary to the existence, let alone the character of God, that it's it's hard to see things clearly as a believer at times. I don't know what I'm looking at. I live in a world where people are telling me that good is bad and bad is good and it's confusing and it hurts. It takes discipline. It takes work. It takes effort to think 
deeply and critically about what we are taking in and what we're allowing to form our heart's affections, our mind's thoughts, and ultimately the choices that we make. Oh, people that I love so dearly as sojourners and as exiles. Peter's folks to whom he's writing, they understood that language very well. They're in a foreign land. They're not where they were. They've lost the comfort of their home. They're living where they don't feel that they belong. And I've got to figure out, I I do, I've got to figure out the customs in this new land that I'm in that can be so confusing at times. And I'm trying to figure out what, what customs Can I be a part of and glorify Christ? And what customs should I not have anything to do with? Anybody in the house with me? We are sojourners right now. We are exiles or aliens, some of your translations will say. Right now. We don't belong here. Yes, we do. God placed us here. What we don't belong to is the ethical system and the philosophical frameworks that are contrary to God that govern the cultures in which we live. We have always been ethical citizens of heaven. You think of Colossians 3. I'm begging you again, beseeching that you you set your things, set your minds on things in heaven and not things on earth. It's not telling us not to care about our life here on earth. The rest of Colossians 3 goes on to unpack that and we find out what it's saying is this. Your mind is to be set totally differently, ethically, morally, relationally. You are different People, you have been saved to a new king with a new kingdom and new kingdom rules. You have been redeemed and invited home by a new father into a new household with new household rules because the father has a new household character. And we live according to the character of the father of the house. And we exist to bring the father of the house glory. I am begging you, people that I love so dearly, recognize in this moment that we are sojourners and pilgrims. Because we are sojourners and pilgrims in that way, then here's the deal again. Abstain. Have nothing to do with the passions of the flesh. Well, Pastor, we all... We all have desires, and God created desires in a a good way. Yes, when they're rightly directed, absolutely. Flesh is not being used as body here. We're talking about sinful activity. Anything that detracts us from the lordship of Jesus Christ or is inconsistent with the character of Jesus Christ. I don't know what idols are in your life. You don't know what all idols may be in my life. However, if we take just five seconds to think, every single one of us will recognize that idols exist. What have you received with open hands by the grace of God that now you've done this with? Where you can't sing that that older chorus, right? 
You can have this old world. Just give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have everything that you yourself gave me. I just need to delight in you. Because ultimately, that's where my heart, that's where my head, that's where my body, that's where my spirit is headed. Amen? That's the end of the story. I want to live that out now. Oh, I'm begging you to know who you are as sojourners and pilgrims and abstain from the passions that are directed by the flesh. Go ahead very quickly and turn to Galatians chapter 5. You'll you'll recognize the text very readily. It'll put this in context a little bit for us and again give us some handles. Abstain from the passions of the flesh, wrongly directed, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Paraphrasing, because I'm going to use the terms standard again. Galatians 5, 17, there's a standard of the flesh. There's a standard of the Holy Spirit. And these two, what does it say? These two are contrary the one to the other. They are mutually exclusive. It's not like there's similarities. There is nothing in common here. There's a standard of the flesh, a standard of the Holy Spirit. These two are contrary the one to the other so that you don't do what you want to do. Anybody in the house been there? You go back up to verse 16 and we get the answer to the problem, right? If you would just walk according to the standard of the Spirit... You wouldn't fulfill the desires of the flesh. And all of God's people go, ah. And as you've heard me say before, that's nice religious language. I'm still not sure that I know what it means. And so the Holy Spirit goes on and he gives us some handles. He wants us to have some clarity with regard to those two standards so that we can understand just how distinct they are from one another. And you look at verses 19, 20, 21, what do you see? Depending on your translation, it would go something like this. The works of the flesh are revealed, manifested, made known, and they are these. Boom, 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 boom. Depending on your translation, the first three words or the first four words are going to be about our sexuality. It's going to talk about a lot about relationships, relational integrity. It's going to talk a great deal about character integrity. The standard of the flesh is this. Now, it's not a full laundry list, but boy, is it a good place to start. Amen? Just look down through it really quickly. Let the Holy Spirit... Speak to your heart and mind. I want you to look through, skim through Galatians 5, 19 through 21 as I read these words. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. See, we can go on and we can, we can speak of the fruit of the Spirit in just a verse after. And we can put those things side by side as I have had many of you do in the past. 
where you list the standard of the flesh here, you list the standard of the spirit here, and you realize this standard of the flesh is the absence of the standard of the spirit. And usually you can take every single word that is listed in the standard of the flesh and you can show where it is the absence of many hues of that larger prism of the fruit of the Spirit. It's the absence of love, the absence of joy, the absence of peace. Boy, it certainly doesn't exhibit kindness and gentleness, faithfulness. Wow, it is the absolute absence of self-control. Do you understand now the reality of when Peter, the Holy Spirit, through Peter, is telling us these things are continually warring, it's a present tense, continually warring against your very soul. I could talk. I could talk to my neurobiologists, neuroscientists. It's changing your neural pathways. I could talk to all the rest of us and say it's warring against your soul in such a way that it's changing the affections of your heart. When you give in to idolatry and you don't abstain from sinful passions of the flesh, It changes you. It causes you to become spiritually weak. When we continue to participate in sin, things that we know are contrary to the revealed will of God and the revealed character of God, it causes us to be spiritually weak ineffective. We're not governed by the Holy Spirit. We could be. We should be. I'm not one to say the devil made me do it. As I have grown and matured in my walk with Jesus Christ, I recognize one thing very clearly. The absolute most difficult person I have to deal with in my walk with Christ is the person I see in the mirror every morning. I'm begging you for your own souls, for the souls of the people you love, for your future marriages, for current marriages, for friendships, for the church for our witness to lost people. Stop. Just stop. Abstain. Do you understand how significant 1 Peter 2.11 is? 
This is part of what I mean. It is so significant because it's saying this, Pastor, this is the way God made me. He says that our passions can be controlled. Amen or no? He says that our behaviors can be changed. Amen or no? Because we're hearing a lot of confusing language in our culture that's saying that is not the case. This verse is saying it is definitely the case. See, we don't just hear that, though, with regard to sexuality and things like that. We hear it as excuses for us losing our tempers. We use it as excuses for habits that we have formed that we want to explain away. How have the entertainment choices that you've made this week that have been crafted, many of them, and for some of us, all of them, have been crafted by unbelieving people who do not share our biblical theology, who do not share our Christian worldview, who do not share belief in God, who do not share faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, how have those entertainment choices changed your soul this week? Do you even know? Or have you caused yourself to believe that that could never happen? Because some practical theologies that are now a part of evangelical Christian thought, they just came from movies. They came from television shows. The values, the criticisms, the morality. It wages against your very soul. And these things draw us away from Christ. I don't think there's anybody in this sanctuary this morning that would out and out say, I want to be drawn away from Christ. I don't, I don't think any one of us would say that. But we allow it. We become too passive. And we allow, we allow the world's cultures and values and thoughts to just kind of stream over us and into us. To the point where it has waged war against our soul continually. And we don't even recognize that we're in a battle anymore. Abstain from the passions of the flesh. Recognize that this is a battle for your soul. And it will change you. Abstain, engage. On the positive side, keep your conduct among the Gentiles. Understand Gentiles in this particular context as non-believing people. Keep your conduct among non-believing people. That would assume you'd be doing so in front of believing people as well. To keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Honorable. Keep it praiseworthy. Keep it Christ-like. 
Exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. It's hard to love unloving people. It's hard to love unlovely people. I get it. We're still called to do so. There are days when it's difficult to express joy. And yet it's a choice that we can continually make. Some of you have heard me say in response to your question, how, how are you doing today, Pastor? I'm thankful. And I'm enjoying the Lord Christ. What does that mean? That means that's the part that I can choose. Amen? That's the part that I can choose. How are you doing today? Absolutely lousy. But I'm thankful. And I'm joyful in Jesus Christ. All three of those things are true of me this morning. Thankful, joyful, lousy. You ever been there? Yeah. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. How can you be joyful in these kinds of circumstances? Because because of the reality of the Lord Christ. Amen or no? That's the testimony. I know where this is going. I know where it ends, praise be to God. This, these shadows in between, tough. How, how can you have confident expectation when the bottom drops out of your world? Because of the triune God, the Father who has sent His Son, who died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. That's how. That's how. So I engage the world with joy. Not fake peace, real peace. Settled confidence. It doesn't mean I always have just this, how you do? oh, wonderful. You know those people. You've heard me say before, I love you all. But the person who is just happy, happy, happy all the time needs to be slapped. <clears throat> and I know I shouldn't think that way, especially as a senior pastor, I shouldn't. But I do. Life has its difficulties. And it is the believer in Jesus Christ who can be sobbing like a baby and still have settled confidence that all that God the Father has promised in His Son will come to pass. How do you have that strength? Trust me. It's not me. The believer can say that, right? It's not me. It is the one who is at work within me. The one whom I have given my life to. He strengthens me in my weakness. And I trust him fully. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. When they are slandering you, anybody in the house outside of me bend back toward the standard of the flesh and say, you want to say that about me? I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm fairly good with words and arguments. You want to say that about me? I'm happy to take that on. In fact, let's make it public and invite everybody to this fun little event, shall we? You ever been there? Have you ever been there when the attack and the slander is against someone you love? That's even worse. Amen? That's even worse. You want to stand up on their behalf. You want to stand up for them.
You're going to talk that way about this person? Hold on for the ride. Because I've been saving up every wrong you've done for the past five years. God forgive us. Now, it doesn't mean you don't call right, right, and wrong, wrong. There are some times that you do have to engage and tell the truth graciously. Always with the hope that you're moving toward restoration. As much as lies within you, you're moving toward restoration. You can't, whatever the other person or persons do, that's not up to you. But when they slander, when they attack, you know what you do? You keep living your faithful life according to the character of God and the calling of God. And you live that life of holiness in their face. You live that life of holiness in front of everybody. Do you hear, do you hear the, the desire here? Boy, does this confront us. How can I do that when I've been hurt so badly and am being hurt so badly? How can I possibly do that? Because you want them to see that life. You want them to see that redeemed life that I, the Lord Jesus Christ, have created. You want them to see my character exhibited in you. You want them to see my new creation lived out before them. Because you want them to know me. Wow. That just puts everything in perspective, doesn't it? And perhaps hurts us just a tinge. Here I was getting so wrapped up in me again that I was not thinking of my ultimate purpose. That God has made me a new creation in Jesus Christ applied by the Holy Spirit for the purpose of exhibiting this life before a lost and dying world so that regardless of what they say, maybe one or two of them, when the Lord Jesus Christ visits them, would by His grace and for His glory, they would say, oh, their God is the one true, living, triune, creator, redeemer God whose story the Bible tells. And I bow my knee to that same God. I embrace that same Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care what kind of method, I don't care what kind of event. I don't care what kind of program is established for evangelistic engagement for Calvary Baptist Church because there could be multiple that could be engaged. But if we are not this, what we say doesn't matter. First Peter 2, 11 and 12 is the best grounding, the best foundation for any evangelistic endeavor. Abstain from evil passions that war against your soul. 
engage the lost community with a godly life that presents his glorious character and salvation. Abstain. Engage. I don't think it's hard to understand. And in reality, with the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit, I don't think it's overly difficult to employ. Perhaps it would be good for us to close our time in quiet. If I have any friends here who have listened to all of this and say, I, I'm not sure that I even know Jesus the Christ that way. Pastor, would you, would you talk to me about that, about that Jesus and how this life can be mine? Everybody else is going to close their eyes. You just walk forward and either I or I'll get somebody else to have a conversation with you to point you to the fullness of that Jesus. For my brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you think you need to pray more toward? Verse 11, Father, forgive me. For not abstaining in these areas of my life where I have taken on idols that have distracted me, that have pulled me away from you, where I have been governed by the thoughts of this world, keep me from the evil one. Perhaps you need to pray more toward verse 12. By your grace, Father, I believe that my heart is clean before you, but my public life, not the facade I put on here, but my public life Sunday to Sunday, it's not, it's not consumed with a passion for the glory of your name. It is not consumed with a desire that others would know you. I'm not living honorably, and I want to. Let's make some covenantal commitments with our Father this morning. When you are done praying, please remain quiet so that those who remain and continue their conversations with God. And as you go, by God's grace, I pray that we go as forgiven, renewed, honorable followers of Jesus in His grace and peace.